Hello and welcome to Analysis with me, Amjad Saleem. Earlier this week, the Student Union of King's College London passed a motion condemning the group's student rights. The move follows half a dozen similar motions passed by other student unions in recent months and with many other unions moving in that direction. The issue of free speech on university campuses is often seen as integral to the institution, but many feel that the student rights organizations unfairly targets Muslims and Islamic university groups. For example, numerous events organized by Islamic societies have been cancelled because of accusations leveled at the event speakers, with pressure being placed on venue owners to cancel or postpone the events. Student rights claims it is responding to what it sees as increasing political extremism on campuses, but an investigation into the group has shown that the group has links to the right-wing think tank, the Henry Jackson Society, which has been strongly accused of Islamophobia in the past. In response, the grassroots real student rights movement was formed last year with the aim of fighting back and discrediting student rights, and it's comprised of students, academics, and teaching staff. On this show, we'll be looking closely at these two organizations, as well as the issue generally of free speech on campus. Joining me in the studio is to discuss this are Hilary Akid, a freelance journalist and doctoral student at the University of Bath, Mohammed Amin, Vice Chairman of the Conservative Muslim Forum, and Ibrahim Ali, Vice President of the Federation of Student Islamic Societies. Welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us. Um, Hilary, let me just start off by asking you um, to explain a little bit about student rights and the link that uh, there is to the Henry Jackson Society. Sure. Um, so student rights were founded in 2009 um, and uh, in 2010 the student newspaper in, uh, in London reported that they received money from the Henry Jackson Society to pay for a, fresh, a stall at the Freshers Fair at LSE. Now this was the first time there were, there were any uh, known links to the Henry Jackson Society. If you can also just explain a little bit perhaps about what the Henry Jackson Society yeah, is as well. Yeah, the Henry Jackson Society um, has been called a neoconservative think tank in The Guardian. Um, it's very uh, pro-America. Um, pro Guantanamo um, extradition defends the war and terror. Mm -hmm. um, you know, neoconservatism is, is is in favor of military action to sort of impose democracy. So that's the politics of the organisation. That it now is clear that student rights is an integral part of the Henry Jackson Society. Um, it, they're based inside the offices, and their staff, as far as we know, are paid by the Henry Jackson Society. So although it claims to be independent, there's really no definition by which I, I believe it can be called so. Okay. Um Ibrahim, as a member of the umbrella body for Islamic societies and having many of your members having been at the uh, receiving end of this, um, how much do you think this is a target on Muslim organizations? Is it is it as part of the Islamophobic attitude we're seeing or is it generally seen in, in the wider sense of um, an attack on free speech? I think it's important to note that it's not only, it's not only been very successful in uh, targeting Muslim students, but also pro-Palestinian activism has been a big uh, aim of theirs to sort of, uh, dis sort of, dis sort of uh, discredit on the university campuses as well. And the great thing about initiatives like Real Student Rights is that it's a genuinely grassroots initiative of Muslim students, non-Muslim students, academics, those actually on the student union movement and actually who want to have a voice for themselves and say, well, really, we're the students and we know what's best for our own campuses and we know the interests of our students on our campuses. And really, it's a, I guess the start of the, the foundation of the student rights, student rights organization is quite timely. We are seeing a time where it's acceptable to say things about Muslim students or Muslims in general. Um, and we've always seen that young Muslims are the ones who are at the receiving end um, of this sort of uh, behavior. Um, Mohammed, um, in terms of what student rights is trying to do, um, some would argue that this is seen as a noble and sincere attempt. I mean, can we, can we look at it as, as a noble and sincere attempt? It's just, or is it more of an attack on free speech? Or, or are we, what's wrong with opposing speakers that may promote certain viewpoints which no, not many people agree with? Well, I don't want to sit here trying to diagnose the integrity or otherwise of student rights, but let me take up the key issue that you raised, the question of unacceptable speakers on university campuses regardless of whether these are unacceptable religious speakers or unacceptable political speeches or people who preach hate for, from some of this perspective. While all of us agree that free speech is an absolutely vital requirement in our society, universities are fundamentally private premises. And I believe it is the responsibility of university authorities to decide who is allowed to come and speak on their premises, who is acceptable and who is not acceptable. 
And that is, in practical terms, actually quite a challenge. Universities have enormous numbers of speakers coming in. Most of them are completely harmless. Deciding who is so unacceptable that they shouldn't be allowed on the premises to speak is actually quite a job. I, I myself have proposed that really the government should put forward its own list of people that are regarded as completely unacceptable. Let's take a concrete example. Right now, the Home Office bans certain people from coming to this country. A recent example was Diodonne from France, the guy behind the canal. He's been excluded from coming to the UK. Now, similarly, there will be people within the UK who the government regards as completely unacceptable speakers. And I would much rather the government had its own list. This list would have no legal force, but it would be there available for people running universities, people running mosques, people running churches to look at and decide if, if a speaker was on that list, they could, the organization could still decide to ignore what the government is saying and have that speaker, give that speaker permission to come and speak. But at least you would have a list with some credibility behind it. My question is whether student rights is a sufficiently reliable organization to be putting out lists of acceptable or unacceptable speakers, because I don't think many people would agree that it was. Ibrahim, do you agree with that premise or that? I actually quite find it hard to believe that the government would be the best place, an institution, to actually decide um, what is an extremist speaker. I mean, up to now, we're actually trying to ask the government what is extremism. Mm. So who, who they are, what is the definition? Exactly, how do you define extremism? I think one thing I would say is that we have a very good traditions country of freedom of speech and expression, and it's enshrined in the Education Act, as we're all aware of. And I think universities over the years have been actually quite smart as to what they see as good for their communities and campuses, and students as well, and students' unions. And there's also guidance out there as well. Don't forget the University of UK, uh, the chief executive, Nicola Dandridge, has said publicly many times that we want as many events to go on as possible. And we thought that the guidance is already available in the public sphere, that's, that's made available to unions, to legal staff, to security, is sufficient, does the job to mitigate the risk. And that's all that universities and student unions are required to do, mitigate the risk, not to cancel events, not to remove speakers from campuses. And again, for me, I would really like to challenge Mohammed. I mean, what are, I mean, how do we go, why would the government be the best place, institution to define extremist speakers when they can't even define the term itself? I find that quite hard to believe, personally. Uh, Hilary, in terms of of, of leading on for that, I mean, how, how do we, who sets that, that boundaries for, 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 for determining what is acceptable or not, or not? Because, I mean, I think in your article that you, that you wrote, I think in December, where you were talking about the segregation issue, which is where you were saying that it's not necessarily about feminism, but it's more about, uh, about Islamophobia. So how do we determine the, the, the borderline between free speech and going against, you know, someone's, someone's views? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's real problems with the whole label extremism, the whole counter-extremism discourse. Um, we know what, uh, you know, we know the British National Party are a fascist organisation, so we can have no platform for fascist policy. We can identify uh, racism, homophobia, those things, and say we're opposed to them, and students can choose for themselves, and universities can, can choose if they want to ban people on those grounds. Extremism is a really broad term. The government's prevent agenda, the revised prevent agenda of 2011, defined it as um, a, a history of vocal opposition to fundamental British values. And then it lists, again, very broad things like democracy, um, tolerance. Now, these are too broad, you know, that, and what we see because of this vagueness is that when they're applied, it's very hypocritically applied, and it's unfairly and unduly targeting the Muslim communities in practice. Um, the government already has a list of 40 universities, which it views as, um, never published by the way, which it views as especially at risk, of students at risk of, uh, of, of um, radicalization. Um, and now we see with, you know, the prevent agenda beyond universities, that kind of risk um, calculation correlates basically with the Muslim Muslim community and the amount of Muslim population. Um, and so in practice, because of these vague definitions, we just get this generalised suspicion of Muslim students and it's their freedom of speech and freedom of political expression that is affected. I think that's, that's the key, Mohammed, from what both Ibrahim and Hillary have been saying is that it is, seems to be targeted at a specific section of the student community, which becomes problematic in terms of saying that the government then should take this over because they, it feeds into this whole premise of uh, scrutiny on the Muslim community and the whole concept of radicalization and extremism. So how do you answer that well, charge all, in terms of... I don't want to get into <coughs> student rights are, are are not pinpointing because they said they're a separate organization. But when you look at who the government excludes from coming to the UK, the government has excluded people who are Muslim, 
example, Raid Salah, or in his case there was a sort of cock-up and he was actually in the country before he was excluded, and it's excluded non-Muslims, people like Pamela Geller, Robert Spencer, Pastor Terry Jones. So it's completely wrong to say that the government is only focused on Muslims. And let me explain why I want the government to have published this list rather than, for example, me or student rights. If I were to publish a list which says that Mr. X is an unacceptable speaker for the following reasons, the first thing that I would expect to happen is a lawsuit from Mr. X saying I'm defaming his character. The government can do it because if, ne if necessary, it can give itself exemption from any kind of libel action. So I believe the government is the right organization to publish such a list, to publish the reasons why names are on this list, and it, then we're up to universities to either follow that list or to completely ignore it. And if the government ha had a practice of putting people on the list who were actually really innocuous, the list would fall into disrepute very quickly. I mean, that, that's an important point, um, Ibrahim, that, you know, it gives a, a framework to actually work from. Um, do you think that that's still problematic from, from your end? And I mean, also like, again, you know, I, I sympathise with regards to the, the way the Home Office uh, excludes speakers from the United Kingdom, and I understand, uh, you know, what, why in some cases they would. Um, but for me, my interest in universities at the moment, and for me, at the university level, the university sector, there's so much guidance out there. It's filled with guidance. I mean, there's been two documents from the University of UK produced in the last four years. There's been three documents produced at the National Year students. Um, ACPO has even given it their, their input. So there's been a lot of good work already in the sector with regards to how to mitigate risk. And also, students themselves have a no-platform policy. Let's not forget, students themselves, every year, national conference, have the right to no-platform individuals, organizations for fascists, racists, or uh, Vs, or, or what have you. So there's a lot of guidance already out there. What I would say is that a lot of speakers that have been uh, so supposedly targeted um, by student rights are UK nationals. So this uh, concept of the government uh, publishing this list, as far, we don't know if they're UK nationals first, or we don't know if they're, if they're international, uh, from, uh, from other nationalities. What we do know is that student rights at the moment and other organizations are engaged out of a smear campaign with regards to those Muslims or even pro-Palestinian activism just because of their political beliefs. And one thing that concerns me, and I've said this many times over and I'll say it again, this would jeopardise the, the confidence of Muslim students, young people, in order to express a political view. We want uh, political participation. That's what our organisation campaigns for. You know, we want the students to get involved in their local elections, their European elections, their national elections, get involved in political parties, uh, all parties or, or, no, or no party, be, be active, be involved. This does a lot to uh, damage all the good work that most students do on the camp on campuses up and down the UK. Hilary, with the recent motion by the King, King's College, um, how effective are these motions? I mean, is this is this? Do you see this keep getting momentum um, across other universities, and is this really the next way to to move forward? Yeah, I mean, the real student rights um, kind of counter campaign against student rights grew out of real, you know, um, organic student frustration that had been built up for several years against this group um, and decided collectively to do something about it. And um, student rights are certainly know that it's discrediting them because their name implies um, deliberately, of course, that they are somehow defending student rights, mm. protecting them, and there's this dual discourse of protecting uh, Muslim students when actually they're viewed as a threat. And so, if you, uh, we did some freedom of information requests to universities, and you see in their emails they're saying they actually single out Muslim students and they say they're a particularly vulnerable group. But then later on, you see that what they're saying is this, this is a dangerous group; these are a threat. And the motions against student rights are, are saying, you know, we reject this group; they're not uh, they're not defending student rights, and um, we're discrediting them in the public sphere, so that hopefully universities Universities will not so so quickly be um, essentially panicked by the threat of negative media into um, cancelling events, and that the press will hopefully not take them so seriously, or at least interrogate their research, which has been really methodically problematic, I think, in the past. Mm. I mean, Ibrahim, do you think that the real student rights um, are a sustain? Is it a sustained movement? Do you, th you see this developing steam, or do you think it's it's just as a reaction to this? And once things calm down. I think it will take another form. I mean, I think the movement's been actually quite positive, really. I, mean, I, think, I think it's actually allowed a lot of students from across the UK to channel their frustration in a real practical and positive way. And I think the number of motions that have been passed right up and down the country and the number of motions that are planned uh, to be passed at student mm -hmm. unions just shows that students do care. 
they are active, they're engaged. And I think if only, and I think there's a lot there's a lot of potential behind it to actually spill into other forms of activism. And what I would say in regards to the Real Students campaign Real Student Rights campaign is that it's genuine, it's credible, it's grassroots, it's run by students. And unlike student rights, they've act I mean they don't sort of I mean what I'm sure it's a, it's a very mature uh, discourse saying that look, there are problematic views on campuses. But what would be the best, for, for, for me as an individual, as an organization, I'll say, the best way to challenge ignorant, bigoted views is to challenge them on the campus. That's the best environment to have, the, have it out, have a discussion out there. Um, otherwise, these discussions could go underground. I mean, and I think that the way Real Student Rights actually, again, coordinated academics, um, students from across the UK, it's been a really smart and novel way, and hopefully it can be modeled for other sorts of campaigns as well to come. I mean, Mohammed, I think, isn't that the crux of the matter, that given the space that students are having this, this mature debate and looking at it from the outside, you know, as sort of non-students, I mean, isn't this what we would like uh, the university campuses to have, these mature debates, to, to tackle the narratives and uh, eventually come out of it rather than trying to interfere and trying to say that this is uh, someone bad we need to ban? And It depends. I mean, there is an issue with some speakers who are promoting completely unacceptable views. However, the organization, Student Rights, hasn't gone about promoting its issue particularly well. It's not been transparent about its links with the Henry Jackson Society. It implies that it has far more student support than it actually has. And they appear to have taken a shotgun approach to the people that they've been attacking. And those all damage the credibility of the organization. But there is an underlying issue which does need to be dealt with and tackled and addressed, in my view. I mean, I, th I think this, I think, you know, we're running out of time, so I, I don't want to sort of prolong this, but this is a very important discussion that needs to take place. And from what I can see, it is about having that space to allow these, these, these narratives to, to take place and, and not prescribing your own sort of judgments and rights on, on this. And I think this is where I guess we would need to to leave the discussion for this part of the of, of, of the session. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, enough time to actually take this forward. So I'd like to thank you all for uh, being part of this. And we'll see you um, after the break. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.